Welcome to uh, my session, The State of Headless and the Emergence of Mac. Uh, it's awesome to see everybody here and just wanted to say it's pretty cool that we've been able to get together after so many years and it's great to kind of see everyone again and face to face and hugs and, and smiles. Um, I'm, my name is Josh Waihi uh, and I'm a Director of Product Management at Acquia. I've been a part of the Drupal community since about 2007. Um, I really uh, had a lot of background and history in doing large scale Drupal deployments. Um, and today at Acquia, I kind of lead two key parts of our product strategy. One is around the Drupal 7 end of life uh, and the other one is the uh, headless CMS. Uh, to start things off, um, back in 2019, I presented a talk called Decoupled, Why We're Building a Worse Wheel. Uh, and I was kind of talking to this community about how building headless and decoupled architectures cost the customer more money, introduced more risk, took more time. It was fundamentally not the right choice a lot of the time, but it was a really cool technology and a lot of people were using it. Uh, and so I was kind of cautioning people to find the right reason to do that. Um, and so I was kind of almost like a, a naysayer to the headless movement. So almost comical that I find myself the you know, headless CMS a guy at Acquia. Um, so today I wanted to kind of give us an update since that time, right? There was pre-COVID, two and a half years have happened since, um, and I wanted to kind of revisit that is now a, a better time to start adopting headless and kind of give you a state of headless and also talk a little bit about what Mark is. Um, so to do that, we're going to just kind of do some level setting, what headless is, talk a little bit about what Mark is, uh, and then have a look at the suitability and market conditions for headless. We'll take a look at some of the technology that is in that space and its maturity, um, and then kind of leave you with some forward thinking insights about where this industry and the space is going. So. Uh, to kick off into what it is. So fundamentally, headless is a loose term that refers to decoupling front-end UX from back-end systems that provide, manage, and control data. Uh, that's it in its most simplest form. And so you could think of it as here is a business system. It's got back-end data. It has a management user interface. And you're going to surface that up to the user experience independently. Those two things now become decoupled. That shouldn't be too uh, new for anyone, but for anyone who kind of missed it, that's what that does. Uh, when you start thinking about the values of headless, one of those things could be a single unified experience where now you can have two backends providing data to a single front end. Uh, that could be something like a CMS and an e-commerce system. And you can now merge your rich content with commerce capabilities in a unified uh, user experience. That would be one example, but basically multiple backends feeding into a common front end. The inverse of that is also another value of headless. So you can have two different user experiences. In this example, a Amazon Echo integration and a Google Assistant integration, and they can be feeding from the same backend. So this idea of, of using the same content to speak to multiple channels is called a omni-channel uh, strategy, which is something that you can do with headless as well. Uh, another still is this uh, headless architectures demand greater agnostic interoperability between backend and frontend systems, making open standards and protocols de facto. So in this example here, where you got a user experience written in TypeScript and another one that was written in Swift, and one uses JSON API and the other one uses GraphQL, and the back end is written in PHP. So in this scenario, you've got uh, three different technologies interacting with one another over open standards, and it's those open standards and protocols that allow that interoperability. interoperability. That open source software foundation, it, it's a foundation for what we call composable architectures. And that's allowing you to kind of bring your own different parts of the piece of the overall solution into the puzzle and, and build that together. And, and open source is foundation to that. Uh, the last paragraph I have here is actually a quote from an analyst that says, composing is when you assemble from specialty parts, but pulling, putting them together in a way that optimizes for what you're trying to achieve. I thought that was a really great way of, of thinking about it as it's a piece of specialty parts. So you're not bringing uh, one thing that kind of does what you're looking to achieve and then you have to configure it from there. You're really building, building from the best of breed of the bits that make most sense for you. Um, another opportunity of headless is for organizations to put multiple of these headless backends behind a common 
API gateway of sorts and essentially produce a content service or a data service layer. Uh, and in doing so, they're able to start reducing the cost of front-end integration because now they just have to integrate with a single content service API endpoint rather than having to do, uh, you know, two, for example, in this case, a CMS and an e-commerce system you could either integrate Amazon Echo integration with both of those two systems and then the Google Assistant with both of those two systems, or you could put the content service in place and then just have them integrate with that one. So the cost of integration goes down. Also, at the same time, you increase your security because now everything goes through a single or consistent content layer and it kind of starts to protect your back-end business critical systems from the, you know, the, the front ends that are uh, you're connecting into them. Uh, finally, another opportunity of headless is that uh, front ends change much faster than the management of the data models they use. So headless architectures allow for back end systems to reside in organizations for longer tenures than fashion oriented front ends. So in this example here, I have a user experience that was built in 2019. It plugs into my back end and then I can build a new experience in 2022 and continue to plug it into the same back end. Uh, and then I can manage both of those at the same time and I can continue to add more things. My back end continues to serve those. So if you think about front end as a general space, uh, it's changed a lot in the last decade or two decades or, two, or however long you want to think about it, like it continually changes. So if most of us here probably uh, remember the days of IE and browser inc incompatibilities and Flash was a thing once and that was a front end and you know, once upon a time we had, um, P well PWAs are still kind of somewhat popular but there's all these sort of different front end te technologies that come around and you need to go and re-innovate and reintegrate with those things. Um, and throughout that entire time, what's remained true is that you need to manage your content. And so by being able to decouple from the front end, you can start to focus more on what actually matters for the business uh, across those different front end experiences, which is the management and governance of content. So to summarize, uh, these are these uh, five different use cases for headless. A single unified experience, Omnichannel, composable architectures, content service, and headless tenure. So let's talk a little bit more about MAC. Uh, MAC is an acronym. It stands for Microservices, API First, Cloud Native, SaaS, and Headless. Uh, and it's a way of thinking about how you adopt headless architectures, essentially. And some of the best ways to explain how MAC, uh, how you think about MAC, is by looking at their antithesis. So a microservices, or firstly up, first up, microservices is individual pieces of business functionality that are independently developed, deployed, and managed. And that's opposed to a monolith. So a monolith often is thought about as like one Git repository, you know, one monolith uh, project. But monoliths can actually be more like when you have dependencies between projects, so teams that can't deploy because other teams haven't done their piece yet, or uh, data flows. So data, you know, flow system data from system A goes into system B and then is surfaced up into front end C. So that's like content syndication or data syndication scenarios. They all are part of monolithic system architectures. And microservices is about isolating those data services to what they are managed and controlled around. Uh, API first instead of API enabled, just meaning that you want to build all of your things for the API first mindset opposed to it being a secondary thing that you add uh, to your capabilities, meaning it, it may not be as fully fledged as like a coupled baked UI system. Uh, cloud native SaaS, I think is kind of poorly termed, but I think what it really means is don't own the things that don't differentiate you as a business. So as a, as a business, if you, um, if you can go get something that is commodity wear, which is what things like, you know, Salesforce or, uh, a CMS or a CRM are, um, don't go and own those things independently because they are commodities that don't differentiate you in any way. So the cost of ownership is only a, is only a cost at no direct value, uh, if you don't, if you don't have to own those things. So, Put those things into SaaS technologies and then focus on owning the parts that differentiate you as a business, which is typically those things that sit in the microservices. And then finally, headless is just about how you surface those SaaS technologies, making sure that they are delivered in headless ways opposed to more headful ways. In practice, it means something that a Mac architecture can look something like this. So in the bottom layer, you have, I guess, the cloud native SaaS services, things like IDP, CMSs, CRMs, DAMs, e-commerce. I hope all these acronyms you're familiar with, but uh, th these are all like the, the SaaS systems and they don't syndicate data between one another. They're all independent, which makes them composable, makes them 
pluggable. Uh, then you have microservices that will consume those and provide more you know, business-specific capabilities like product APIs, entitlement APIs, and asset APIs. So those things are then consumed by your user front end. You have a much richer uh, experience that's more oriented around your business rather than your capabilities. This might look a little bit like an MV, uh, a model view control, MVC system as well. So, you know, your back end systems, your SaaS systems are your model. They are your database, your storage layers. The microservices are your controls and the user experience as it always has been is your view. Um, it's also worth mentioning that microservices can also appear as serverless functions, commonly called middleware. Uh, between the back end and the front end. Uh, and just kind of nomenclature, if you're familiar with the term middleware, it's often thought of as something that sits inside of a Linux box, uh, but in microservices architecture, it is literally the piece in the middle there. Okay, so that is a loose, a high level overview of what headless is and Mac. So let's talk about the suitability and market conditions of headless. So we already talked about some good business drivers for doing headless, the reasons why you'd want to do it, single unified experience, omnichannel, et cetera. But there are also some other reasons why you might end up in headless that may not be such good reasons. Uh, one uh, such as by design, that's where you have good intentions, but you're kind of missing the business reasons why you would actually want to do it. Uh, so that could be something like front end choice forces you to go to headless. Uh, I see that a lot. Uh, people have decided you know, they go to a creative agency, creative agency creates a great looking front end. They decide that it should be a front end React application or something along those lines. And then CMS is an afterthought. So it's just a place to store the content and manage the content. So you're now forced into headless because your front end said so. And that, if you do that, then it means that you can't think more strategically about the business drivers and it can mean you end up implementing it, implementing it in a way that uh, doesn't give you the longevity that headless could offer you. Uh, market adoption is another reason. Um, that is maybe by design, but not a good reason. It's just because all the cool kids are doing it. Um, and so you might choose to go and do it, but because it seems like a cool thing, uh, that was definitely what was happening in 2019 when I gave this talk, and uh, it resulted in you know, a lot more money being spent and a lot more risk being taken on and no added value to the customer. Uh, the third one could be by constraint. So you are kind of forced into it because you don't have other uh, capabilities. So you might say, well we, well, we don't have a business justification for doing it now, but it's future-proofing. Um, and that could be really difficult because how do you know that you're implementing it the right way uh, to be properly future-proofed um, if you're sort of adopting it for other reasons? Or you might just only have front-end developers available to you. Uh, and so if you don't have back-end PHP devs doing stuff, you could be literally forced into doing all of your integration work at the front end. And so headless makes the most sense because Node is where you can do most of your uh, integration work. I also added this quote here that by 2025, 70% of new applications developed by enterprises will use low code or no code technologies, up from less than 25% in 2020. So that's a quote from Gartner um, that, that they suspect. And so I thought that was really worthwhile to consider um, because if, there, if enterprises are expecting to do a whole lot less coding, um, then you really want to consider whether doing things with code in Node right now makes a lot of sense if you're thinking about its longevity. Um, also around suitability, you might want to think about the content delivery strategy, what the use of the CMS is actually for. Are you building campaigns? Do you have a number of product pages to build out? Is it an intranet or portal? Uh, maybe it is a mobile app or an IoT device, something like a digital signage screen, or maybe it's a brand site. You look through those types of use cases for a CMS, there's also a number of different content requirements, like how much pages or content is it handling? Do you need layout control inside the CMS? Do you need brand control, the ability to change color and size and padding? Do you need uh, content components, the ability, the ability to ship little segments of, of content in, in particular ways? Should the data be structured or freeform? Uh, is the, do you need multiple front ends? Uh, or does there need to be an API that you're exposed to? Those sorts of things help also determine whether you need a headless or a hybrid or a coupled strategy for your CMS. And so see, you can see here that headless has one clear green scenario for being, being adopted, but all the other times it could be, it's an orange. So it could be, but it, there are other options as well, like hybrid and coupled that might be more suitable. So you really have to kind of think about the strategic drivers for doing headless, because still you might find it is not the most economical choice. And so you have to weigh up the, the cost of implementation between headless and headful to determine the right uh, strategy and direction. 
So let's look at the market conditions, and we're going to look at three areas, the technology adoption, the market adoption, and developer adoption. So back in 2019, I gave this uh, diagram showing a kind of maturity or adoption model. So you have uh, early adopters who innovate on the technology, early majority of people, well, that's where um, frameworks start getting built out. The late majority is where you get large enterprises and um, big prime time money uh, coming into a project. And then you have the laggers who are um, only going to adopt things when it's like a turnkey solved problem. And I put in here the spaces where I thought no Drupal and Java kind of sat. And Java was just like for reference because I think between Java, PHP and JavaScript, they kind of have a similar length of distance between them in terms of project maturities in the market. Um, and this is what I said in 2019. I just think this is still probably more accurate today than it was back then. Um, and so we'll go into a little bit more about this, but I want you to kind of keep in mind about where things are in terms of early adopters, early majority, and late majority. Uh, this is a tier list that came from the state of js.com. They did this in 2021, looking at framework, JavaScript frameworks um, as a, you know, how good they are. And they're kind of color coded by whether they're front end frameworks, back end frameworks, or build tools, or testing frameworks. Um, here you can see, if you're not familiar with tier lists, uh, S tier is like God tier, they're really, really good. A tier is like they're pretty decent. B tier, they're not that great, and C, they're rubbish. So the um, this is kind of how the uh, this survey is actually surveying JavaScript developers and asking them what they thought about the frameworks that they were working with inside the community. And so here it's really clear that Next.js is a great back-end framework. It's largely preferred, uh, as well as Vite, which is a, uh, a compiling or dev uh, environment capability. React's definitely there in A tier. Uh, also new frameworks like Svelte, which is what uh, Project Browser and Drupal was built out in, um, as well as uh, Vue.js inside of A tier. Um, just for time, we'll keep moving on here. So uh, in terms of usage, uh, that top bar uh, is React. So for front-end templating frameworks, React has the most usage at 80% of developers having used it in the survey, uh, while the next is Angular at 54% and Vue.js at 52%. So very clear that most developers in the JavaScript community have worked with React at some point. And when we look at uh, backend uh, frameworks, Express.js, which is really just a, a better web server than raw node is itself, um, is the, the top thing that everyone has worked with or used. But when we actually start talking about server-side um, static site generating frameworks, uh, Next.js comes up at the top at 45%, followed by Gatsby, Nuxt, and uh, Nest. Uh, this is um, builtwith.com data, looking at the top 1 million sites in the world and the technologies that they use. So the big graph here is React usage, and you can see that React peaked at around 112,500 um, you, you know, sites using it, so you know 12% thereabouts um, in 2021. Um, and then on, I've got two smaller graphs, you probably can't make out the... Uh, the y-axis on there, but you've got VU and, and Svelte, and they're a much, much smaller uh, ratio. So VU was actually around the peak at around 60,000, and Svelte's only at about 700. So they're much, much smaller levels of adoption. Uh, but this is a greater indication of like if a, one, a top 1 million site takes adoption of a technology, it kind of shows its, its sense of stability. Um, in contrast, by the way, I would say uh, Drupal is about a fifth the size of React in the top 1 million. So there's definitely a lot more React usage in that space than Drupal. Um, speaking of Drupal, uh, if we look at, say, uh, Drupal as a CMS versus Contentful, which is a, a SaaS-based headless CMS, uh, Drupal still has you know 10 times the amount of usage in the top 1 million than Contentful SaaS sites. So the SaaS CMS kind of space is still really emerging for uh, for that kind of space, it kind of means it's more early majority adoption opposed to late majority, or the stability isn't quite kind of there yet. Um, so having a look at the top CMS uh, in the top one million, um, it's actually a pretty good picture of like how stable or resilient headless technologies are. Um, if you look at them, you'll see WordPress is actually thirty percent of the market. Drupal is up there in third at just under three um, percent. The first headless front end Netlify doesn't show until about 0.82% utilization. So it's still really, really small. 
Um, but all other headful solutions outside of you know, Drupal and WordPress make up another 4.12%. All in all, that really means that like headful solutions, coupled solutions are still the predominant flavor of sites in the top one million. They're not uh, yet kind of fully in a, in a headless space. Um, if you look at, uh, this is a, a graph graphing uh, stack overflow uh, questions and engagement by language and GitHub uh, ranks and in, in, in projects. And so here you can sort of see the, the top, you know, like on the y-axis is popularity of rank on, on Slack overflow, uh, Stack overflow, sorry. And on the x-axis is popular, popularity rank on GitHub. Uh, as you see right at the top there are all the top languages and they are JavaScript, Python, Java, PHP, and CSS, top five. And TypeScript's in there too. So for those of you kind of familiar with the JavaScript community, TypeScript is a, a, a sort of close part of, of JavaScript. And so it's strange that it's almost measured as a second language because they are kind of almost like a symbiotic uh, to one another. Um, in terms of top languages, you've also got um, JavaScript has been the top language. Uh, this is actually from GitHub from their Octaverse report. Um, so it's been the, the main language on GitHub for a long, long time. But the key here, as you can see, TypeScript of the last few years has picked up its pace. That black line is now sitting in fourth place, and PHP has dropped down down to I think sixth uh, place. So it is definitely dropping in popularity as a preferred project among developers. This data comes from codingdojo.com. They uh, are providers of developer uh, education, so teaching people how to program, essentially. Um, and when they looked at um, preference of language by their uh, education community, you can see over the last five years that PHP has been the smallest and is continuing to decline. So new, new developers coming into our industry are preferring not to learn PHP, they're preferring to learn Python, Java, JavaScript, that, those sort of languages. And on the right-hand side is um, programming languages that employers were looking for in 2022. And unfortunately, PHP is not on the list. It doesn't show in the graph. So it's not a language that people are looking to uh, you know, do things inside of. Those are other languages like JavaScript and Python. So to kind of summarize on suitability and market conditions, Headless is an emerging and growing technology. It's an early majority trend still. Very low adoption in the top one million. Uh, suggests solutions are not complete enough, like not turnkey enough to reach mainstream consumers. Solutions developed on JavaScript platforms provide greater access to development resources. And Drupal and PHP needs to provide turnkey node code cap capabilities that empower front-end developers and content managers to build that digital experience. So moving on, we'll now look at technology maturity. And this is just kind of looking at some of the key techno technological terms in the headless space and kind of give some definition about what those are. To start with, there is uh, a kind of, sort of composable reference architecture, lots of different ways to deliver content. If you think about, you break down content delivery into store, render, and serve, uh, those those kind of pieces of the puzzle sit in different parts of the architecture in lots of different ways. So we have traditional Drupal, where it's all done inside of Drupal. There's partially decoupled, where part of it is done outside of Drupal. Decoupled, where the rendering is handled outside of Drupal. Headless and static, where you're uh, offloading a part of that static rendering into a, a back-end, front-end, and then sort of serving it over to the true front-end. And then you've also got the sort of serverless capability uh, that's also an emerging space we'll talk about shortly. Um, the other thing that's kind of happened since 2019, in 2019 I talked about uh, the state of JavaScript that was presented by the lead developer of Chrome, uh, which he did in 2018. Uh, and since then, uh, the web's gotten slower. So the Medium web page has way more JavaScript in it than it ever has had. It's got 161% more JavaScript. Uh, it, this is, by the way, data from the httparchive.org. Um, and then the time until interactive has also gotten slower. So although our devices have gotten faster over the last three years, we've somehow managed to put more JavaScript in them that actually tanks them worse. Um, and this is a continued problem, and yet 47% of users expect a maximum of two seconds loading time for an average website. So let's talk about some of the ways that we try and fix that. Um, this is the Jamstack kind of architecture. And what that based on, is based on is basically a backend 
a JavaScript process that does something called SSG. That is uh, static site generation. It'll go and pull your Drupal content over its API and build static renders of what you would otherwise render in the front end. The idea is that you can, when it gets to the front end, it's already ready to render and you can get that first time to meaningful paint down really quick. Uh, so that helps with SSG. That then it gets pushed to a static store and then you serve uh, a Node.js instance in the front end that is going to basically store those, uh, serve those static files. Uh, and then frameworks like Next and Gatsby provide this thing called ISR or DSR, um, and that's inside of SSR, which is server side rendering. ISR is incremental site regeneration. This is a great place for three letter acronyms. Um, and incremental site regeneration basically refreshes that static site content as the CMS updates and it revalidates that it is. So in a lot of ways, Jamstack is using Node like we use Varnish today. It kind of does it like that, except that rather than priming the cache once you've done a deployment, it primes the cache before you do the deployment. And it actually means that you can deploy live. It doesn't matter because uh, it's, you're, just, you're just deploying static files that are ready to go. So it's much higher resilience. And because it's static files, it's always fast and quick. Um, the kind of frameworks that are providing Jamstack capabilities are Next.js, Nuxt.js, and Gatsby. Um, and then on from there is serverless. Serverless is actually the same architecture, but there's one key difference, which is that there is a edge routing that's introduced at the top end, and that edge routing is able to just offload directly to the static store. Uh, by being able to do that, uh, it can not use Node.js, and with serverless technology, you can boot up that uh, Node.js instance or is it that JavaScript script and run it when the request comes to that service, to that SSR task. Um, with serverless, you're able to basically be billed for the amount of time that you're actually using compute process instead of static store process. And so you get a, another scale of efficiency out of that process. But otherwise, it's fundamentally the same thing as Jamstack. Um, there are a lot of different providers in this area. So Vissal do it, Gatsby Cloud does it. You can use AWS Lambda functions if you're so keen to do it all yourself. Cloudflare Workers also is another solution for this, and Netlify. Cloudflare Workers, by the way, also open source. I dropped an open fast in here uh, because I had uh, Tom from Amazy Labs um, talking about it to me several years ago, but it sounded like it hasn't kind of made it as far as an open source project. But you can see here all of the other projects are proprietary. So serverless is kind of like a limited access place at the moment. I think there's definitely work that needs to happen to try and make that a more of an open capability. Um, another sort of theme with this, and this goes in line with what I was saying about the median page performance, is as the code bases go up in size, the performance goes down. And so as all of these frameworks get added to JavaScript applications, more capabilities and richer capabilities get added, uh, the performance starts to tank. So this is another common thread. Another issue is something called hydration. So we just talked about how you can do static site generation on the back, on the back end and you can produce, you can send static renders and you get a faster time to first meaningful paint, uh, but you don't get all the way to first time to first uh, interactive, uh, fully you know, ready to be interactive. If you've ever had the experience where you've seen a web page come up and then you've clicked on a button and the button hasn't worked yet, uh, that is the hydration problem. And that's essentially you bring up a static render of your site and then uh, you still need to bind all of the JavaScript capabilities because they haven't fully loaded yet. And uh, so that's that's something that is baked into a constraint of React. Uh, this uh, graph actually comes from Builder.io, who produced a framework called Quick, Q-W-I-K, uh, and they have addressed this hydration problem by doing lazy loading of JavaScript. Not, not lazy loading JavaScript, but lazy loading of JavaScript. And so when you click the button, the, the function downloads on the fly and then runs, so you only download the executable code you need when you actually need it. Um, WebSockets is another technology that, to be honest, hasn't really matured a whole lot, uh, mainly because maybe in the content industry, uh, we don't have such a great demand or use for it. Um, but it is certainly uh, developed into its own area. Um, so your content WebSockets, essentially, you need to push to a connection manager. A connection manager is going to you know, ma manage connections between you and the clients. The clients are going to have open connections to the connection manager. Uh, we used this with the Australian Open, so we were pushing live updates of 
tennis scores to, to people who are listening on mobile phones. And uh, you know, we would need to, we actually used Ably in this case, so we would publish a message to Ably and Ably would relay that through WebSockets to all of the connected clients. Um, completely, you know, JavaScript and node based technology, but a completely different use case and not something that you can sort of service with the uh, SSR capabilities and the other infrastructures I'd mentioned already. So I wanted to kind of call that out here. Um, finally, the technology maturity, uh, GraphQL is definitely something that has taken a deeper popularity. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about how that's going to grow in the future or the way that analysts think it's going to grow in the future. But to kind of uh, explain this from a some non-technical term, uh, if you think about it, user experience now uh, can actually start with a domain modeling uh, discovery process. So domain or you know or data modeling was often something that you know DBAs once upon a time kind of owned, and then as CMS experts we started owning it. Uh, it now gets sometimes started at the UX level where the domain model is first understood, that informs the user experience and the designs so that you get designs that actually make sense to implement. Uh, and then you get uh, your front-end developers who take those designs and start uh, working with them. And this is where GraphQL can kind of come in because if the domain model is understood, you can sort of directly translate that into GraphQL uh, and define that as the, as the data model you want to work with. GraphQL fundamentally lets the front-end decide the API and not the back-end dictate that. And so it is um, much easier for front-end developers to work with, and it's kind of agnostic for them to work with as well. So they're less likely to care about what the back what the back end uh, is. And so I think it's uh, GraphQL is often thought of as a technology, but I would start to think that it's more an architecture rather than a technology, because it really does change the way that uh, you think about how front ends and back ends uh, coalesce. Uh, so technology maturity. What about the CMS? So when we looked at this headless space at Aquia, we felt like Drupal was kind of missing the mark in two key ways, right? One of the key things about headless is it's not really about the CMS. It's not really about the back end. It's really about the front end. Uh, and we're a great community of back end developers, but we weren't doing enough to really attract front end developers. So we sort of set out to build a CMS that could cater to two key personas. Uh, content manager and a front end developer. Uh, inside of that, we did uh, a couple of things for the front end developer. We built an API dashboard, so sort of centralized all the things that the front end developer wanted to do instead of having them distributed across a Drupal admin administration menu that they didn't really understand or want to understand. Um, we also made sure that Open API was installed by default and had Redoc connected up to it so they could get access to the JSON API docs. Uh, and then we adopted Next.js. We contracted in Chapter 3, who um, maintain the Next.js Drupal uh, libraries. And they built for us a Next.js starter kit that integrated with our CMS uh, and then provided like a great way to start building Next.js sites with Aquia CMS. Um, because we had that starter kit, we were also able to build a content preview function inside of the CMS so that content managers can see what their front-end site's gonna look like. And it's completely integrated with um, content moderation. So you can draft and you can preview in draft state um, and you can do that through Drupal access control as well. Um, the only other area that we had, I guess, is that's that's different or unique in the content management, content management space is the ability to publish to omni-channel. So you can publish, publish to multiple Next.js endpoints and preview through different uh, Next.js uh, capabilities. Okay, so wrapping up into forward thinking insights. Uh, yeah, so uh, thinking about CMS, headless CMS use cases, there's kind of two that after looking at all of the different capabilities and requirements, we've kind of consolidated them into two market key market areas. One is what uh, analysts like Gartner call backend for front end. Uh, that's essentially a scenario where the front end, I've mentioned it was a kind of a constraint where a front end is chosen and then they go looking for a back end to implement. Uh, in that kind of scenario, it's marketing led or it's like a non IT team that's leading the project and decision making. Um, it's a single channel project. So they're not looking to open up a, a publishing capability to lots of different spaces. Uh, smaller budget, most likely as well. Uh, yes, budget for a new front end, but not like a massive undertaking of a back end. Um, the da data aggregation is really going to still c happen at the front end. So um, if you need to connect with third party data sources, you'll probably do that in the front end in the node space. 
And that's largely because your project is probably going to have no developers on it, not PHP developers on it, uh, unless they're full stack. Uh, composition, layout composition is going to be a requirement, and that's going to be a requirement for the CMS. So that needs to be there de facto. Um, but it's a CMS for a channel opposed to a service, and something like a media library is all they're going to really need for that. On the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum would be the content service uh, scenarios. That's where there's more like a business and IT partnership happening on the customer side. They're looking at something that's going to transform their enterprise as a project opposed to a much smaller pro uh, budget project. As such, they'll have back-end developers, so they'll be able to customize their CMS more amenable to the needs that they have. Um, they're going to aggregate data behind an API gateway like that content service example I showed earlier. Um, and then layout will happen and compose by channel opposed to being inside of the CMS. Composition won't be a CMS capability. Um, it's going to be a content as a service and it's more inclined to be integrated with things like digital asset management rather than uh, Drupal's media library. Um, so more sort of like analyst thinking here uh, is by 2025, more than 50% of enterprises will use GraphQL in production environments up from 10% in 2021. The graph on the uh, on the right hand side there is of how Gartner gets, like the frequency of, of inquiries Gartner gets broken down by kind of API type. It might be a bit hard to read, but the big blue bar is saying OAS plus REST. OAS means open API specification, uh, which basically you can translate into Drupal speak as JSON API. So right now, there is more JSON API demand and interest from Gartner clients at the very least than GraphQL, but they anticipate that will change in the next three years and there will be much more GraphQL demand. So that kind of tell, tells me as a product manager that we need to have more GraphQL capabilities as a part of our CMS uh, verbatim. All right. Um, so finally, kind of looking at some of these from a, 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 an architectural standpoint, what does backend for front end look like, architecturally speaking, and content service? So um, in a backend for front end architecture, you're going to have your integrations at the bottom there, things like e-commerce, CRMs, DAMs, and PIMs. They're going to be consumed by your CMS through out-of-the-box modules that you can plug in and integrate with those things. And you might even do content syndication uh, and so you're not really following a Mac architecture in a backend for front end model. Uh, you're going to consume that through there. And because you're consuming all of your data into your CMS, all of that data is available for you to build and layout manage management with. So if you want to embed content into custom, into custom layouts, you can do that. And then you can expose those restfully to your front end, like Next.js to go and do its, its renders. The Next.js flows it up to your sort of distribute layer, which is either a static site or a mobile app or some other kind of IoT capability. Inside of a content service architecture, however, you can see it's much more complicated. This would be more of a Mac style service architecture. So you have a data services layer that again are more cloud native SaaS. They're all SaaS capabilities. Um, they don't talk to one another and they shouldn't talk to one another out of, out of principle or policy. So they all surface up their capabilities through an API gateway. And in this, in this diagram here, I've suggested that that is a GraphQL mesh. So you kind of put GraphQL and API gateway together as a single place to, to consume from. Um, that then goes into either directly to the front end as a Next.js consumption, or you could route it through a composable layout manager layer. Um, and we don't really have a sort of solution for that in, in the middle there. There are some tools out there, I'm happy to mention them, but um, that is a key point here is that layout management is decoupled from CS, CMS capabilities in a content service architecture. And one of the key reasons for that is because you're composing your, your pages with more data than just your CMS. Uh, and so you, you don't actually always, in these kind of uh, scenarios, don't always want to have those two things coupled together. Um, so Acquia's journey on this is, you know, we kind of did a, a bit of analysis and figured out, you know, that we have a bunch of gaps uh, to kind of fill up and how we can make a, a better path for, for Headless. So we kind of put together a high level roadmap after kind of analyzing that. And I mean, I don't know if what, what you can kind of see of here, but this is, I guess, just kind of like a high level roadmap. We've got over 2023 to build out new node uh, JS hosting capabilities integrate web form functionality out of the box with web form module and, and React components, integration with uh, Widen DAM, 
improving opinionated configuration management and automated settings like PHP is just some sort of uh, maintenance work we have to undertake. Building a layout builder for headless capabilities, uh, at least in that back end for front end scenario. Um, bringing in a headless CMS SaaS product as a beta by the middle of next year. Uh, and introducing something called, I call codeless recipes. If you're familiar with uh, Project Browser as a core initiative and another one called Starter Templates, um, if those two kind of come together and have a baby, you get recipes. And um, if you can stop pushing those through a composer project and delivering them over a RESTful service, you get codeless recipes. And this is, starts to create this ability to extend Drupal without having to add code. Uh, and that I think is a really significant and necessary part of um, extending Drupal uh, longer term so that we're not so dependent on somebody else's PHP code to be able to extend and integrate with third party capabilities. Uh, and then finally, GraphQL support is something we also want to um, make happen as well. Um, but to kind of make sure that we do this, we actually have put together a headless developer advisory board. Uh, that board is um, really key for us. We basically have invite members of our community and our partners to that board. Um, and they help us with this roadmap. We basically tell them what the roadmap is, um, present to them any new products that we've developed and demoed, um, and then we uh, get their feedback and help let them tell us their stories of what they've been doing with Headless, what's good, what's bad, what should change. We share with them their roadmap, they tell us if it's good, if it's bad, if it should change. Uh, and it's a, a really great relationship to have to be able to let the people that want to use our products influence the roadmap as they should. Um, and we you know, really want to make sure that that is a developer-centric uh, drive opposed to a customer-centric drive as well. So we do that. What's in it for, for people who join? So they get to provide feedback to our, to our uh, headless products and roadmaps. They get early access betas. So next uh, quarter we have plans for Node.js betas um, for our new uh, Node.js Node products. We conduct one-on-one -on -one meetings with our product teams with those people who understand what they're doing and what they want us to be doing. Um, and we also uh, provide publishing opportunities on our dev.aqua.com community for people to express their, their thought leadership around that as well. Um, so for us, that's a really um, important part of our, our journey. We really want people to come on, come on board and join. For the last two quarters, it's been something that's been kind of closed and invite only. But in this quarter, um, we're happy to kind of open this up. And I don't have any partners from the APJ area, uh, APJ being Asia, Pacific and Japan, <laughs> inclusive of Australia and New Zealand. Um, so we don't have anybody in that board advising us from this part of the world. Uh, so I invite you to, to sign up and join if you uh, scan that QR code, you'll go to our landing page where you can learn more about this, read a bit more in depth about it. The sort of base requirements is that you attend a quarterly meeting uh, where we present and demo. You fill out a survey that happens at the end. We also host optional monthly check-ins where you can just jump on a call with us and chat and uh, ask questions and make demands and what, what have you, and that's all cool as well. Uh, all, the all the stuff that I work on, uh, which is Acquia CMS and Next.js Starter Kit stuff is all open source and it's all available in the community up on GitHub. Uh, and so you're also welcome to be a part of that and contribute, trial it out, have a look at it, um, and submit pull requests if you really want to. So I'm not sure what we're doing for time, but happy to take questions if we have it. Yo, is there a mic? Um, so, what about using like Drupal as the front end and then having things automatically feeding into the Drupal to like automatically create content items? Would that be headless as well? Or is that something different? Um, because I like work at a government agency and we've got like tens of thousands of documents that need to be published onto our website. So we've got like a feed that feeds into our website to create content items for those sorts of um, content. So. Yeah, so I, I, the management of content is a back-end task, right? So you, that is a, a back-end capability. And if you're building your front-end look and feel from a back-end capability, I guess the, the whole premise is that you're limited to it. So you're coupled to it as well. So if you wanted to build a new front-end or the front-end that you want to communicate on changes, you're kind of you know, up, up, up a paddle with no up a street creek with no paddle, as it's called. So that's kind of the, the problem with that uh, capability. So to, your, to answer your question, like Drupal's not really considered the headless front end in that scenario, but it is your layout manager. It is your front end, right? So that's not a headless architecture. That's just a coupled architecture. Paul. Hey, Josh. 
Um, thanks for the presentation. It's fantastic, by the way. Um, so my question is uh, slightly outside of, uh, of what you presented here, and it's slightly provocative as well, but it does underpin the success of what you presented here. And it's, it, it, you, you touched on a point regarding PHP, and it's um, uh, the interest uh, uh, of PHP uh, by, uh, by you know, developers and also employees. And based on that point, um, what's your uh, opinion on, on the, on the long-term viability of Drupal? Um, I still think Drupal is incredibly viable. Um, it's a very mature CMS. It's got rich capabilities, and, and the No community is not trying to solve that, really. Um, they already, you know, don't, they don't need to solve what we've already solved in that regard. They're trying to provide something new, which is new front ends and, and new kind of ways. So... Um, I think Drupal's certainly still more viable, but I think the way that we have thought about delivering it is changing. Um, so the uh, it's not that we will get Drupal jobs where we are building the front end out. Well, I mean, this is the definition of headless, right, is that you're not building the front end out with Drupal. You're doing that with a different part of the technology. So we covered earlier at the, at the beginning of the presentation the suitability for headless, and right, there's certainly a space for it and so there's still decoup there's still coupled there's still plenty of space for coupled based builds and when we're doing coupled based builds then you know you still use drupal the way we always have and do drupal projects that we always have but when we're doing headless projects the cms has a much more minor part of the project it's expected to be sort of feature complete and ready to go and you don't need to focus development time and customizing the cms so the role of a PHP developer or a Drupal developer in that project is much more minor, if not ab completely absent. Um, but that's not to mean to say that Drupal is not a part of it, right? So, and this is kind of why there's a um, that push towards cloud native SaaS, the Mark uh, architecture, is that you can still have Drupal providing those kinds of capabilities. Um, I still think that there's a big space for differentiation of Drupal and being able to create lots of different vibrant you know, distributions of Drupal and the recipes and module being able to deliver those different capabilities in different ways. So I don't think that we'll have like a diminishing um, market for Drupal necessarily, but maybe there's not as much PHP work in those headless projects. I think that is something that is going to possibly happen. Oh, come on, not on that bombshell. <laughs> come on over here. Uh, thanks. Um, this may be uh, two technical questions and too specific. It's just for the headless. I'm, I'm working in the test automation uh, area. So headless, we are trying to um, testing the API for the headless Drupal, um, which we um, not sure uh, how to do, with, where is the best practice? Do you have any suggestion? Like contract testing kind of things, thanks. What are you trying to test about the API? So um, we have uh, Drupal as a API provider and have a possible um, uh, API consumer, like front end applications or multiple in the future. So mm -hmm. how can we make sure um, Drupal release we don't necessarily sync the release with front-end applications. Oh, right, right, yeah. How can we make sure we are not breaking the front-end applications? That's the purpose of testing. Yeah. Um, so the early way of solving that was API versioning, which was a permanent, permanent nightmare, right? And like, if you think about a headless scenario where you your headless front-end is a mobile app, and now you've got all these different clients installing different versions of your app on their phones, trying to interact with your API, changing it, making a change to your API is freaking difficult, difficult, let alone the fact that you'll have to keep backwards compatibility for a long period of time as well until the attrition of that, those older, older versions have kind of churned on those platforms. So um, it's actually really a really difficult problem. Basically, you have to think about how you introduce change to your API. For example, you can add fields, but you can't remove or change them. Yeah, that might be a, a kind of constraint to using something like JSON API. But something like GraphQL, however, is much more different because in GraphQL, the, the schema is kind of defined by the client. They manage their own API and their own API changes. And it's no longer your problem to deal with. 
So you still have to kind of provide the consumer services, but the, there is this like layer of abstraction that actually de-risks the challenge of API changing. I know I haven't answered your question around testing of the API, um, but I think like I think about it and go, well, what's there to test? You have to make a curl request and it comes back with data. And like if it does that, then it works, right? But um, and then there's obviously like performance constraint to that or security considerations or what have you. So you can certainly build up assertions around those things, but I'm, I'm not kind of super clear on like a testing framework for. Uh, for APIs in particular, but certainly to protect yourself from versioning, you know, there are certainly architectural changes like GraphQL that you could take or policies like not modifying fields that can help with dealing with those things. All right, that's a better, better note to end on. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. Yeah, th sorry. Thanks for your talk, man. It was awesome. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the layout builder is kind of the biggest problem that we need to solve before we can kind of go all in with headless builds. So yeah, I'd like to just get your opinion on what that like middle solution would look like, I guess. Yeah, so the, the key is like layout, the role of layout is different between these two architectures, right? One can be inside the CMS and the other one, whoops, cannot. So that I think is one of the considerations and um, they are different market solutions, right? Kind of tell you which part, or what, what kind of solution you're building with Headless. Um, I know there's some pretty talented guys called Stregen who uh, have actually solved the layout builder integration so they've got some great demos of how they can use their CMS to um, use layout builder and expose it over an API and render that out in Next.js and Angular and Vue. So you can do layout building with Drupal core um, and expose it. So you know I don't I'm not sure that that is necessarily a problem. Um, although it's not true. It's not you know like you you have a um, place in the CMS where you get to do that composing, but then it's another another tab or a different place where you're doing the previewing of that. Um, and that's okay, I think, you know, um, but there are obviously also solutions out there where you're edi editing what you're seeing and that is what it is, right? And it's kind of real time informing and editing. And that's kind of more like in this architecture, what layout manager is going to be. It's going to be, um, and also like you know, consuming of multiple types of content. So that the, the real challenge for a CMS is if the CMS exists in the microservices layer, it's not allowed to talk to the other systems. It can't ingest content from those systems. Uh, and so it's the composer that needs to, you know, do the layout management. And then you actually need to think about how do you make a great UI and the composer layout capability to, you know, if, if you're a, like there's all, there's also a learning challenge for, for content managers. Like if you're a content manager and you're used to both creating content and managing the layout of content inside the same tool, the idea of having them in separated tools is stupid, right? And so they, they'll want those two things to be kind of integrated. So I can also see a need to want to compose in a, in a something in the layout manager, but also create content in the layout manager, which suggests you might need to use GraphQL mutations or something to be able to push that data um, back through to the CMS or to whatever system that, that data kind of belongs inside of. Um, yeah, so... I think this part doesn't have to, the layout manager in here doesn't have to be Drupal, right? It could be something else. Um, I'm not familiar of, like there's like a, a project called Grape.js that's like an open source project that could be that composer layout manager, but it doesn't have the ability to pull in GraphQL data, for example, or third party data to be able to um, build your experiences. So I do think that that's a problem space to kind of mature and solve before this becomes more of a standard practice. And until such a time, we'll see more of that type of scenario where, and I, I definitely think that the majority of gigs right now are like this, where you do need to have layout management inside of the CMS. And it's a luxury, right? But it's also like, you know, you've got a Drupal developer handy, so it's quite easy to do a composer require and add a module to integrate your CRM or whatever it is that you need to do. So those there's still plenty of opportunity space for that. Um, but you know, you can imagine from a business standpoint or even an agency standpoint, you might not want to have to, you know, resource both PHP capabilities and JavaScript capabilities. So if it's, if you can just have a JavaScript developer on, on the project, it's more economical, it's more competitive, right? So you want the CMS to be kind of turnkey and out of the box ready to go. Yeah.
this is probably a little bit of a, a naive question, but uh, Drupal seems to have a lot of you know, good mature features for headless. It's great for com com administering complex content, you know, permissions are pretty sophisticated, a lot of things like that. So just as a pure backend system, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty ready. But I, I suppose whenever you're starting a new project or doing something new, you, you want to look at not just, oh, how can I make uh, Drupal do this job, but also you know, are there better options out there? Uh, I suppose I, I'm a, a aware of a lot of uh, frameworks and things like that, like for instance Laravel or Spring Boot, things like that where you can build backends that can do exactly what you need. But I'm not really aware of any other any uh, CMSs that are out there that are actually would actually be competition for as, a, as a headless solution. Like you meant, I think you mentioned uh, Contentful before, and yeah. obviously there's WordPress. But you know, what else, what is what is Drupal competing against in, as a as a headless CMS? Yeah, good question. Uh, so if you were to do a Google search for top headless CMSs, you'll find lots of top tens, and they won't include Drupal in any of them. Um, so the content contentful CMS is the sort of primary SaaS CMS people can use and it's free to use. So it's a SaaS service, cloud service, but you can use it freely and that gets developers familiar with it really quickly. Um, there's content stack, which is more of an enterprise version of a, of a headless CMS um, and completely proprietary as well. Then there's a whole range of open source ones. So there's things like Ghost CMS or Strappy is a, another really common one. Um, so all of the node-based CMSs are interesting because they are also single-page applications, which means the experience of data modeling with Strapi, for example, is much more elegant than data modeling with Drupal. And uh, you know, if a JavaScript developer has to choose the backend for the customer, they're either going to want to choose something they don't have to manage, which so it's a SaaS service, or they're going to choose something that they can manage, which is going to be a node project. So the uh, you know Drupal doesn't come into consideration when you ask a front end developer what's your favorite CMS to work with. So I, I you know that's a, a problem space that I have to uh, work on and at Acquia to try and you know change that perception by you know, connecting more with the front end community and help showing that that Drupal's not a traditional CMS that it's just as good as a front end. Because I agree with you that I think a lot of there's a lot of capabilities in Drupal that make it very suitable for headless development. I just don't think the community is as aware of that as they, as they could be. No. Great, thanks everybody.